All right, so here we start in the middle of the class. Um, maybe I'll find the video from last last time. Y'all y'all can watch the first part of it there. All right, so receivable turnover sells over accounts receivable. Higher is better. Days in, lower is better. Compared over time, compared against peers. I don't think it really works for receivables, just given where we are today because of the heavy use of credit cards, especially for consumer stocks. Um, if it's deteriorating, maybe their sales are growing too fast. Are they're pushing sales to customers when credit's a problem and they're trying so hard to sell? They're like letting anybody come in, kind of like in 2008 with the subprime mortgages. It's like, hey, if you're breathing, you're qualified for a mortgage. Or maybe customers have some disagreement. All right. Huh? Oh, sorry. I got uh, kind of behind what if what's deteriorating. Um. The average collection period. If average collection period, like it's taking longer to collect, it could be that your your customers have bad credit and you're really pushing sales to anybody. Or your customers just have some disagreement with the bills. Okay. Inventory turnover probably will be important for several of your firms. That's a pretty common one. Costco, Ferrari, probably. Um, now, someone's doing the game company, I forget on that one, right, Carson? Yeah. So they don't really, they don't have inventories. You know, NVIDIA doesn't have inventories. They make they make chips, but they don't actually build them. They Somebody else builds them. So there are firms that don't have inventory, but I think most of your firms will have an inventory. Even firms like a Disney will have inventory because they have inventories for their theme parks and for their cruise lines, but it's usually a small number. But for them, some firms... If you're doing a Costco or a Walmart or Chipotle, those kind of firms, inventory can be a huge, literally lemon, those are huge deals. So inventory turnover, we don't use sales. Instead, we use cost of goods sold. It's very similar, but not quite, but it's, it's something related. So inventory turnover, you use cost of goods sold. It's really the one exception where you don't use revenue or you use something different. Cost of goods sold. And again, higher is better. If it's getting worse, then your sales may be deteriorating. You're not managing your inventory very well, or you just have obsolete inventory. It got tricky there for a while with uh, personal computers because Windows was putting out a new version of Windows like every year, and everybody's buying new machines. And so you know, computers are getting obsolete like in six months. That's not, now people are hanging on to their PCs for years. You don't need all the fancy stuff the new Windows versions have. But there was a time there where PCs every six months, you were buying all new ones. So it can be deteriorating pretty quickly. Um, business inventories have gotten a lot better and you can, you can look at that. So if you just type the word Fred in business inventories, I love Fred. Fred is the St. Louis Fed. So be aware of this. Fred and almost any statistic, Fred and CPI, Fred and GDP, Fred and whatever. And you click on it and it's just so wonderful. They fix their site so well. They used to have a Fred add-in that you could add into Excel and do this, but now you don't really don't need it, need it because there's business inventories and you can download it to Excel at any time. Um, that's total business inventories. There's different graphs that you can do. Change from a year ago, percentage change, compound annual growth rate. There's all different things you can do. Uh, you can go back further in time. That may be as far as they're gonna let me do it. You don't know the notice the improvement here, but in the 80s and early 90s, business inventories got really, really good because something called just-in-time inventory became the thing. And that was huge. Uh, notice inventories got hit by 2020 COVID. The gray line is is um, recessions. You notice the inventories fall during a recession. So inventories are really important for economies because if inventories get too big and it gets too many inventories, firms start laying off employees because they've already built everything they need. And if inventories get real thin, it's really good for the economy because then they're going to have to restock inventory so they hire people back. So you can see, look at what happened after COVID. Just amazing rebuild. So not nearly the same in 2008, but 2008 was pretty dramatic. So um, 
We're getting better at inventories. Um, now, just-in-time inventory is good and bad. It's got its good side. It's nice that you don't have a lot of stuff just sitting there in the warehouse. It's bad when 2020 happens and you have these supply disruptions and you you don't have you know if if people can't get access to what they're selling that's it's a huge issue so you know like my bike shop during covid they sold every single bike they owned they had and they couldn't restock them they wish they had massive warehouses full of bikes that they could go to but they didn't um so you got to be careful there we had a few of those cases back when tokyo had their earthquake Tokyo was the source of a lot of car parts. So Ford and GM couldn't build cars after that earthquake because they couldn't get access to the parts. So just in time is an issue. You gotta be really, really careful on that. So it's it's good, but it's also risky. So those of you that are management majors, this is a big part of your job is how are you gonna manage those inventory? You don't have too many because that's a waste, but you don't wanna make customers mad because you don't have some stuff in, in place to sell them. Um, so day sales and inventory, you just take 365 over inventory turnover. So in the Bloomberg, line 48 on the capital IQ, uh, uh, IQ data has the inventory turn. Higher is better. You can see Walmart has actually deteriorated the last few years. And then you can do days inventory. There you just take plus 365 divided by that. And you can see their inventory has gone from 38 days to 44 days. Now, Walmart, if you go back further back in history, they went from small groceries to massive groceries. They're almost more of a grocery store now. And you would think grocery would have a much faster turnover in inventory, or you'd hope so, and at least anyway. So you would think it would have improved dramatically and it, it did, went from 44 days down to 38, but then for some reason the last few years, it's deteriorated. And why is that? You know, we have to do some research on why that is. So you've got that to use if you wanna use it for those that make sense for your company. So the operating cycle can be your accounts are, well, you start with inventory. So what is your inventory turn? And then you have accounts of payable turn, turn how long does it take to pay your vendors? And then you have receivable turn, how quickly do your customers pay you back? The combination of that tells you whether or not your operating cycle is a source or use of cash. So this is why Walmart is a source because they buy stuff from their vendors, but they don't pay their vendors. So they get stuff from their vendors and they say, hey, we'll pay you later. And then they put it in their stores really, really good, really well. They're, they've got it down to a science, right? They have that warehouse on 35, right? Or is that 10? On 35, that big warehouse. They they know right when stuff shows up. They got a really good site. If you work, if you manage at Walmart, you would be a pro on, on inventory. You'd know what was in stock, what was out of stock, exactly when to reorder, those reorder points. And they sell like 40, 50,000 items. So it can be pretty complicated. Um, so you get that down to an absolute science. Um, so Walmart, they buy stuff. They don't pay their vendors. They get it in their store really fast. Their customers buy it. They get cash from their customers. And then weeks later, they pay their vendors. That's a wonderful business model, both for liquidity and for turnover. It's the kind of model you want. You can get a model where you get cash from your customers before you pay your vendors You've got a you've got a business model that's pretty impressive. <clears throat> uh, so your how long is an inventory? How long does they get from your customers? And how slow do you pay your your vendors? Why does Walmart get away with that? Because well, they're like twenty five percent of retail. Walmart says, "Hey, we'll pay you when we want to." What are you going to say as a vendor? Like, no, no, you're going to pay me now. And Walmart says, "Yeah, fine, we can go to somebody else if we don't really need you." So they have a lot of power and so they can control their vendors. All right. So that's what we talk about, the cash conversion cycle. I might have put one in your, let's see if I left it in there. So I did put the cash conversion cycle in here. It may not work for your firm, but I did it for Walmart. 
So they sell outstanding. You can see what that is, about four days. Inventory is the most important one for them. It's been fairly consistent over the 10 years, but it's deteriorated a lot from 2020. 2020 might be a COVID thing, uh, which kind of makes sense, right? Because they ran out of everything. 2020 is the only time I stood in line for an hour outside of an HEB wanting to go grocery shopping to buy one gallon of uh, milk. Um, I try to get away with, um, I think it was eggs. No, it was bread. I want to buy two loaves of bread. And they're like, no, you only have one. I said, yeah, but last time I hear you didn't have any bread and I didn't get any. And they were like, no, you can't get any. So they ran out of inventory, right? They just couldn't get enough stuff. So that may be a deterioration. That's you know a good thing. And then their accounts payable, that's where they excel. They pay their, look how slowly they pay their vendors. So their cash conversion cycle is actually a negative number. They get cash before they pay their vendors. Their conversion cycle is actually a source of cash. That's pretty unusual. Uh, but is it getting better or worse? It's certainly better than 2015. It's worse than 2020, worse than 2018, but you know it's better. Than, so you look at it over time. So you have that in your Excel. It probably doesn't work for half of the companies here, but if you're doing Lululemon, it might work. If you're doing Costco, it definitely works. And you can look at that conversion cycle over time. It works even if that's a positive number. So I don't know, Lululemon, this might be a positive number, but if it's a positive number, what would you want it to do? Go from 10 to four or go from four to 10, which would be better? 10 to four. So you want it going lower, just like the networking couple. So do y'all see the link between turnover and liquidity? There's a pretty strong correlation between those two. All right, so how do you improve this? Where do you look at this? Um, some firms, your turnover, I should have put a space here, your turnover ratio might be revenue per employee or revenue per square foot. So let's look at your choices and let's talk about which you might use. So if you go to print page one. It's uh, like the one where there's like nine A and nine B. Yeah, so what you'll do, you'll pick one of those and take the A, B, or C off of it. So don't have chart nine C if you don't have an A and B, all right? So you'll pick one of them. So I gave you four choices. I gave you revenue per square foot, which works really well for Costco and Walmart. Might work for Lululemon. I don't know how many stores. Do y'all buy Lululemon in a store that's a Lululemon store, or do you buy it somewhere else? There's stores. Stores? Do they sell more online or more in the stores? More online. Probably more online. Yeah, so if you do revenue square foot, and most of it's in online. So Microsoft has stores, don't they? Do you think revenue per square foot? Last time I was at the Apple store, the Microsoft was right across from it. There was like 100 people in the Apple store, and there were four workers in the Microsoft store. Do y'all go to Microsoft to buy stuff? Not very often. So revenue per square foot would work for Microsoft, but it probably doesn't make any sense. So you have to think about it. Revenue per employee, a lot of y'all are gonna do that. We'll talk about when that makes sense. Revenue per pp and &E, I'll show you when that makes sense. And then revenue per store, I would probably use that for Costco because Costco stores all look about the same. The reason I like revenue per square foot for Walmart is some of their stores were small and some of them are massive. So square foot helps me adjust for that. Costco's all look about the same. So Lululemon, I'd probably use revenue per store for them, probably because I can't get square feet all the way all across. <clears throat> we'll talk about, for those doing Lululemon, what do you do about the fact that you're missing some data? So here's where you're going to send me your spreadsheet. I'll fix it and send it back to you. Because Statista actually provides a number of stores, but for some reason it wasn't in Bloomberg or, or Cap IQ. So we can fix some of these things. All right. So when you use square feet, if you have square feet and the bulk of their sales is in stores, I would use revenue per square foot. So if I was doing AutoZone, Walmart, um, if I have square feet for Costco, I'd probably do it for Costco as well. What about a um, Dollar General? Would square foot work there? It would work. What would you more likely use? I'd probably use stores. Have y'all ever seen a Dollar General that didn't look exactly like every other Dollar General? 
Aren't they all the exact same square feet, essentially? Um, what if we're missing the values for the revenue per square foot? All right, so if you have stores, use stores. If you're missing on both, you have to send me your spreadsheet. We'll have to find the data. If it's missing two years, there's two ways I can fix it. I can go find the data and fix it. If I can't find the data, I'll just kind of eyeball it between the years. I might use the average. But yeah, there's some of y'all might have to send it. You could try to fix it yourself, but trust me, you're not going to like trying to figure out my spreadsheet, right? I know my spreadsheet really, it's really hard to use somebody else's spreadsheet. So I'll fix it in five minutes versus you, you doing it in five hours because it's just hard to figure out where all the numbers go. All right. So retailers that have stores, that works really well. What about employees? All right. A great firm is Accenture. Accenture just sent me a job. Y'all see I put job opportunities on our Canvas sites. So Accenture is a great firm. One of our alums said they're hiring people. So Accenture, y'all know the history of Accenture? What was Accenture before it was Accenture? Anybody know? Any of you accountants know? Have y'all heard of Arthur, Arthur Anderson? The big, big accounting firm that went under after Enron. So Accenture is the remnants of Arthur Anderson. Accenture is a very, very impressive IT consulting firm. What's their most important asset? If you're a consulting firm, what's your most important asset? Your, your employees, right? So if I were doing Accenture, if I were doing IBM, you think of IBM as a technology firm, if they're really a consulting firm, I would do revenue per employee. If I were working at a big accounting firm, even if I'm not publicly traded, I'd be looking at revenue per employee. All right. So if your most important asset is your employee, I would use employees. I would think with Microsoft, I would probably do revenue per employee. So how many of y'all think you might use employee? I might use employees for yours. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they're inventing games, right? Your employees, if I were doing a pharmaceutical, where you have your scientists and, and doing new drugs, I would use employees, huh? Okay, UPS. Let me let's look at UPS. That's a, Alex has a perfect setup. This class is like the best at setting me up for the next. So how do you know when the next one makes sense? Revenue per property, plant, and equipment. So there, what we're looking at is firms that have a lot of property, plant, and equipment. It's a huge part of their business. So how do we figure that out? So if you go to Yahoo Finance. And you can actually even do it uh, on the spreadsheet, but I'm going to do it here. Let's look at UPS. What I like to do is go through their financials, bring up their balance sheet, and on total assets, look at their property, plant, and equipment. See that $38 billion out of $71 billion? That's a huge part. If their property, plant, and equipment's around 50% or higher, Revenue per PP&E probably makes a lot of sense. Okay. Let me give you a contrast here. So let's look at uh, Intel. Look at their property equipment. $148 billion versus $191. Revenue per PP&E is what I use for Intel. They make semiconductors. Well, what about NVIDIA? They make semiconductors, but look at their property plant equipment. It's it's only about 10% of their assets. Why? Because they're not a fabrication firm. They don't actually make the, the uh, chips, whereas Intel has the multi-billion dollar fabrication plants. They're massive, right? Um, so for NVIDIA, why do you think I'd use for NVIDIA? I use revenue per square foot. When's the last time you went shopping at an NVIDIA store? Revenue per employee, right? That's what they do. They invent chips. So that's how you can tell if they have a huge property plant and equipment, revenue per PP and E would work pretty, pretty well. Did that answer your question, Alex? Yeah. So yeah, revenue per for PP and E is a great one for UPS. So <clears throat> Yeah, if you have NAs, when you put print page one into your paper, you're going to hide those NA rows. So if you don't have stores, you don't have anything you're not using, just hide those rows. Now, if you're if you have good numbers, like with Walmart, I had good numbers for all. I'd probably include them all. But if you just have all zeros and all NAs, just take those two rows and just right click and hide. Them. Don't delete them. 
never delete. All right, don't delete rows because it messes up the entire spreadsheet. Visa, I'd probably use revenue per employee. Yeah, Visa is a kind of a strange firm. I use. Do you have employees all the way across, all the way across? So, like, I put it up on double finance, and I never put it low compared to the. Their PP&E. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't use PP&E for Visa. Visa is a revenue per employee firm. <clears throat> At USA, we use revenue per employee, and it makes a lot of sense for insurance companies and banks. Uh, the problem with USA is we had banks and certain we had property casualty life insurance. And investment firm, they, the firms all look very, very different. So the, you kind of had to adjust for it. Uh, it said they have no, but it's like they don't have no employees, but there's no data for 2016. So. Yeah, if you're missing one year of employees, we either try to go find it and send me your file and plug it in there. If you want to look for it yourself and say, hey, I'm missing 2017, but I know they had 24,000 employees, I can fix your spreadsheet. If we can't find the number, what I'll probably do is I'll just average between. You can see Walmart's not very good. What do you notice about Walmart? Do you think they had 2,300,000 employees exactly? No. It's a very rounded number. It's going to distort the numbers. So I don't like revenue for employees for them. On employees, it's what the gap accounting calls as reported data, ARD. When it's as reported data, the firm has the right to report whatever they want. In your format are not reported. So your square feet like that, employees like that, you're kind of stuck with whatever they decide to show you. I could probably go to the, go somewhere like Statista and get better numbers for Walmart on employees, but I'm not going to use revenue for employees on, on Walmart. All right. Is anyone doing Disney? Yes. Okay. So there's no good solution for Disney. <laughs> if I were doing the cruise lines, I'd do revenue per PP and E, or even better, I would do revenue per cabin or berth. But that's just the cruise line. All right. If I do revenue per employee, you get a ridiculously horrible number. Why? Because they have all these employees for the theme parks. But that's probably one I would use. But it's going to look terrible. So in your paper, you're just going to have to say, Here's the revenue per employee. It's not the best number. I mean, it's not a good number, but it's the best one I have to work with. PP&E, maybe, but you know, you, you're kind of between employees and PP&E. Neither one of them is good. The problem with Disney is there's a really good turnover ratio for each one of their segments, but there's not one for the whole firm. So just kind of messes things up. Um, but yeah, just go do your best with what you have and you know, kind of talk through it. What other firms y'all have that you're, who's not sure what they might use? Ferrari. Yeah. Ferrari, um, well, let's look at their property plant equipment. It could be fairly. It's like 80%. It's not huge? No. Yeah, it's pretty small. Um, so there are ratios you can use that we don't have. So with a Ferrari, I would be tempted to do revenue per car sold. If you can get that data, we could build it if you like. <laughs> um, what else could you use Ferrari? Revenue per employee wouldn't be horrible for Ferrari. It kind of depends. It kind of depends on how they sell their cars. So for Ford, people that sell four cars aren't Ford employees, right? They're these independent uh, dealerships. So it gets a little tricky. So. Uh, does revenue employee looks decent for you? Do they have a lot of employees? Well, like well it the revenue for employees kind of your default if you can't figuring out anything else. That's what we use at USAA, and it worked well for USAA. So uh, I was going to say for Chipotle, and it also really has a low um, revenue for PPE plus with food service. Oh, I would do revenue for store for Chipotle. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Facebook. Oh, Facebook. Facebook the revenue for employees is about all you've got. Now, I will say with Facebook, there's a much better one. If you want to do it, I'll pull the data. But for the best one for Facebook is revenue per uh, active user. That works really, really well. We can get that data. And Facebook is incredible on that. It is amazing. So what have Facebook done over the last 15 years? They went from very low advertising to fully utilizing it. So they went from like $4 per user to like $25 now, I know people talk about uh, Facebook paying us for their, 
they couldn't pay us much because they only make about $25 per user. So maybe they could send you a dollar a year or something, but they went from like four bucks. I think I even have the data. I can probably even show you. Let's see if I can find it. Um, so if you wanted to try something like that, we could certainly do it. Facebook starts with an F, right? I didn't do it as, I didn't do it as meta. I don't see it. I know I... Oh, there we go. Facebook. Ah, oh, there we go. Facebook is kind of old. <clears throat> so here's their ad revenue per user. Look at this. It's really amazing. And 2013 is only six dollars. So that's per per user. So you know the advertiser is going to pay more money if you have more more users. Went up dramatically, eight ninety five. Went up dramatically, eleven dollars, fourteen dollars, nineteen dollars, twenty four dollars, and this is all old data. But that's why they made so much money. So they started off not doing much, and I certainly noticed that y'all probably don't use Facebook. But think about your grandmother's Facebook. <laughs> Um, you know, 10 years ago, you almost never saw advertisement on Facebook. Now you see it all the time. You know, if I cough, there's a, a cold rem remedy face, you know, advertisement on my site. So they've gotten really, really good. Now they've had a little trouble with Apple, right? Because Apple's restricting how they can share that data. So how is that going to affect what they can do? They can't target their ads. But yeah, so if you want to do uh, ad per user, we can we can get that data. Kappa IQ has that. So, you know, email it to me or if you want to learn how to do it yourself, come by and we'll, we'll get the data. Um, and this is, I can't remember if this was a, th this is Capital IQ. So I actually got that data out of Capital IQ. So they have the data. And so there are firms like that, like telecom, it might be revenue per um, plan. How many plans you have out there? Netflix, it might be revenue per how many users they have. That, that one gets kind of boring, right? Because Netflix charges, you know, we charge $10 and revenue per user is going to be $10 probably. But now that they have the advertising side, it gets more interesting. If I were doing, I don't think anyone's doing Nike or Adidas or Adidas, have you ever said yet? I would probably do revenue per advertising spend. How much, how much revenue are they getting? for every dollar they're spending on advertising. And so there's, it kind of depends. Um, so how do you improve turnover? Obviously you can advertise more, that's gonna hurt your margins, right? Cause you're spending more on advertising that you hopefully get more people buying your product. You can add new products or add new features. Anything that saves the customer money is beneficial to the customer, that, that helps. New services. So I'm going to tell you, I, I'll tell you what the best turnover success story I've ever seen is McDonald's when they started selling breakfast. I worked at McDonald's for a month, worked for Chick-fil-A for a week. So I got a lot of fast food experience, but with McDonald's, you know, think about breakfast. They didn't have to buy heart any new assets. I mean, I don't know if you've seen them switch from breakfast to lunch, but a guy takes this big stick and he scrapes the uh, grill and he starts throwing hamburgers now. And that's all they do. Everything is on the same thing. Why did they do that at turnover? The revenue per store. They just added an entire new meal. You see how high their turnover just, just went up. And not only that, it was a very popular. You didn't know they didn't know if that was going to work or not. You know, when they started, they had experiment with it. It became a really popular. In fact, some McDonald's are like, well, do breakfast 24 hours. Um so it was really popular. It's also a higher margin product. So it actually helps the margin as well. That was a huge win for McDonald's. But then you go to a Wendy's. Wendy's has struggled with breakfast. See, have y'all ever bought breakfast from Wendy's? It's just they've struggled with it. They tried buying Tim Hortons and doing donuts. I don't know why Sonic has got a breakfast, but McDonald's, huge win. Adding a drive through that was a huge win. At first, people are debating about that because you have to you have to spend money, right? So you have to refurbish your building, put these things in. Not a huge expense, but it is a cost. But that added a lot. I remember Whataburger. Y'all probably think this is 
the 1920s, but it wasn't that long ago, Whataburger was the first to start accepting credit cards. And that was a huge win for them. And then everybody else copied in and did the same thing. Um, so yeah, I don't know why Whataburger was the first or at least the first in Texas. Um, so anything you can do that drives customers to your company, but it's real important that your competitors can't do what? Can't copy it. So what did airlines do? They started putting TVs in the airlines. How many of y'all stopped flying Delta and started flying United because you had a TV and didn't really work? But if it did work, what would happen? Everybody else is going to add it too. They used to charge a fortune for that. Now it's all free, but so it probably was a big waste of money for them because it's probably didn't pick any customers up. Um, so like the American Airlines, they're like redoing seats. Yeah. So I don't know. If, if they can stick more customers on the plane, yeah. that's what they got to do. All right. We'll talk about a few more of these here. So this weekend, you you wrote your everybody got wrote liquidity and solvency this last weekend, right? You got your first draft. I've already started seeing some of y'all. If you want to set up a Zoom, so um, hopefully this next weekend you can do turnover and margin. But we'll see how far we get on on Thursday. All right, I'll stop it there. All right, so no team got a hundred percent. We'll do another multi choice on Tuesday over turnover and margin. But let's help. This is Dolby. I forget who's doing Dolby, but let's just some practice. Cash from operations, what word might you use on that? Yeah, I would probably use the word flat. To me, stable, so a lot of students use stable. Stable kind of has a positive, but if it's just going sideways, it should be going up at least with inflation. So to me, stable is it's not growing fast, but it's consistently growing. So like two or three percent. To me, flat is it started and ended up at the same time. Volatile might be it starts and ends, but it's like that. So, I mean, think about the words. To me, stable, it may be just subjective, my definitions of things. But I like the word flat as a negative connotation. It's not right. It's just flat. What about working capital? What can you definitively say there? Is that a good picture or a bad picture? <laughs> Looks pretty bad. Something obviously happened, right? In what year? 16, 2017, something happened. So this is Dolby. It's hard to say what it is. I don't know Dolby that well. Um, there's somewhat of a monopoly on certain things that they, you know, dominate certain markets. So why that would have switched, but whoever's doing Dolby can look and see if something unusual happened. Remember the bottom of print page one gives you some good indication on that. So you can see accounts receivable. That's the, that's the answer, right? It's all accounts receivable. Accounts receivable jumped dramatically. Nothing, nothing else changed that much. Why did accounts receivable jump in one year? That's unusual, isn't it? So what's going on there? Who knows? But that's something you could certainly research. What are they doing with their cash? Buying a lot of stock back, not consistently, but that's pretty normal. They are paying dividends pretty consistently. How much debt are they using? Doesn't look like they have any debt. So what are you going to do with chart five? Why do you think he or she's going to do a chart five? Um, using like what would they say about it? Yeah, well, what would you do with it? Uh, it's below the median. So... Yeah, but what are the numbers? Negative. Oh, negative. I would leave chart five out entirely. They don't have any debts, so their interest expenses actually interest income. So I would just leave it completely out. Chart six, could you put chart six in there? It's all zeros, but you could, but it's not telling you much. So it's kind of like Lululemon has the same issue. So not telling you much. Now they have a lot of cash that they're sending out, especially in 2021, they sent out $600 million. But is that entirely due to free cash flow? What else could it be due to? They're reducing your capex quite a bit, so that could have something to do with it. So, just give you a little bit more practice on this. All right, so I'm gonna going to reintroduce activity ratio since I forgot to hit Zoom last class just real quickly, so we have it in the video. So remember, activity ratio is the whole focus. It's really two things. We're going to get into that a bunch today. 
It's revenue growth, but it's not just revenue growth. It's revenue growth versus the effort to get revenue growth. So we're talking about what's their key asset and how's that key asset growing versus revenue growth. If revenue is growing 10%, but the key asset's only growing two, that's really good. They're getting a lot more bang for the buck. But if the if revenue grows 5%, but they had to add 10% more for the on the asset, that's not good. They had to put a lot of effort in and didn't get much out of it. Anytime you see the word turnover, you think revenue. And then whatever's in the title, if it's asset turnover or whatever, you're going to have whatever's in the title in the numerator and then, I mean, in the denominator and something related to sales in the numerator. So higher is better. The trend going up, you want that to be better, be higher. And so what we're talking at the end of last class is how can you improve the turnover for a firm? So you can have some kind of sell, but the problem with the sales is you're cutting your prices. So that's going to hurt your revenue, but then you sell more items. So you might get more in. So a sell is kind of a two-edged sword. Mergers and acquisitions can help. If you have something where uh, Citibank tried this, where they bought travelers and their thought was, we can pick up more customers because they'll come in our bank lobby and they'll buy not just banking products, also buy insurance and other things. Didn't work out too well for them, so they sold out travelers soon after that. But they, they tried that. Corporate structure. McDonald's is a really good example of that. So McDonald's turnover improved dramatically in the 90s and 2000s because they converted a lot of company-owned stores into franchises. So what happens with a franchise? Your revenues do what? Your revenues go up or go down if you franchise? Revenues go up. Yes, so before all of the revenues were theirs, now what do they get? Oh, they get royalties. They get 10%. So revenues do what? Increase. Drop a lot. What do assets do? Drop. Drop even more, right? Because they don't have to own all those stores. In fact, McDonald's may be more of a real estate company than a fast food because they make a lot of money, not just on, on the McDonald's, but the real estate they own about it. So you could almost argue McDonald's is really a real estate company. So asset turnover goes up, even though revenue drops, their assets dropped a whole lot more. And that gave McDonald's a huge benefit for growth, except you run out of stores to franchise after a while. You can't convert more than 100 percent. They still have a few company owned stores. I don't know where they are. So if a firm like, and I don't know the other Sonic, Jack in a Box, I don't think Jack in a Box is franchised. I don't think Chipotle is franchised, but Chipotle could greatly increase their asset turnover if they went franchising. That could certainly work. It's a temptation to do that. Uh, if you read, uh, listen to the business breakdown for um, Cinnabon, that's a franchise model. And I really encourage you to listen to that one. Um, they have the former CEO, uh, Kat Cole, very impre impressive CEO. She's kind of my type of CFO who really understands, I mean, CEO who really understands the business, both as a business marketing customers, but also from a financial standpoint. And she makes a really strong case for them. But franchising was a huge part of the growth story because, you know, eliminating them have to buy all these assets but they're getting the revenue as, as royalties. And something you can definitely do, if I were doing a grocery store or a fast food, I might just list them off on asset turnover and I might shut down the 10% worst asset turnovers at the bottom and just shut them down and my asset turnover will go up. So Albertsons had closed down a lot of stores. Which ones did they close down? Probably the ones with the lowest asset turnover. Because margins are probably going to be about the same in all stores. Low asset turnover, you shut those down. Um, so there's probably other strategies. We've talked about some in here um, with McDonald's. McDonald's is a good case. I think McDonald's may just be running out of ideas for what to do. So, <clears throat> yeah, you have to kind of think about what's driving the revenues and make sure you're measuring that as much as you can. We talked about Disney having trouble with that. And I think it's really interesting what Disney's doing. I love sports, especially college sports. So I click on ESPN. They say, hey, tell me what what cable company you use. I was like, I don't have a cable company. I would pay 
ESPN, 15 bucks a month if I could watch college sports, but they don't give me the option. Why? Because they're probably the only reason cable TV exists, aren't they? <laughs> Do your parents still have cable? And sports is the only thing you need. I mean, it's, so ESPN has a strong relationship there. If they start doing their own thing, they're probably breaking contracts with some of the cable companies. But I don't want a cable contract. I would pay ESPN money to have access to this. Um, so I think I find that interesting. They say it's going to be a lot more expensive than other subscriptions, probably because NFL and NBA are going to charge them a fortune. College will charge them a fortune as well. But I would watch college games. In fact, I'll watch a college football game from 20 years ago, even knowing the outcome, because I just college football is interesting. I wouldn't do that with the NFL. Um, so that's something they could do to generate a lot more revenue and since they monetize ESPN a whole lot better. We'll see how that works out. What did their stock price do today? Anybody know? ESPN. So their stock price, it won't show it to me. Up eleven percent a day. I don't know when they announced the uh, the ESPN thing, but I think it actually fell when they announced that. But today with earnings, but ESPN used to be is pretty pretty amazing. Disney, you think of this massive firm. There was a time not too long ago where ESPN was essentially over fifty percent of the value of Disney. Now that's gone away because ESPN struggled somewhat. Um, but they could monetize that. So, you know, that's that's an important way to get revenue. We talked about Facebook last time, how they really have done the advertising side pretty well and gotten that part of their business up and, you know, really, really generating a lot of sales. Um, so anything you can do to get better at it, um, it's going to show up in your growth. So for some firms, revenue for property plant equipment, we talked about last class at Property, plant, equipment, it's 50% of their assets. Revenue for PP&E is not a bad one to use. None of you are doing pharmaceuticals, but revenue per R&D, research and development, can be a really good one to do. If you're, none of you are doing utilities, I don't think. Was someone doing Nextera? I remember someone was thinking about Nextera. So Nextera, so utilities are regulated entities and they have something called regulatory assets. Revenue per regulatory assets is a really popular one for them to use. Telecom and cable and you know Netflix, those type is revenue per subscriber. You know, with Netflix doing the advertising, it's gonna be interesting to see what that does to their revenue. That should be interesting. Now we know Netflix has been shutting down the sharing and that's probably hurt them some but it's probably picked, you know, so the net of that, you'd have to kind of look and see what that is. Netflix goes from $10 a month to $15 a month. They're going to lose customers. We're going to pick up more revenue per customers. You know, all those things you want to look at and just see. Energy companies, they can be revenues per proven reserves, revenue per pipeline mile. There's a lot of things. In fact, energy just has, they're off the charts. One really thing, good thing on energy, because energy is such a hated industry, especially right now. If you go to their website, like Exxon or Chevron, they have amazing investor relations. They're trying to sell themselves as good companies. And so if you want to learn more about them, go to their website. Um, they usually have Exxon, I know, has these incredible PowerPoint presentations. If you're doing a presentation on Exxon, you can probably copy and paste some of their slides from their PowerPoint. And they give a really, really good information on, on their company. Uh, in fact, Energy is one of the ones, if you go on YouTube and just say financial analysis of an energy company, all kinds of YouTubes will come up and really help you know what ratios that they look at. So one thing you can do is go to your company's annual report or go to their website and see what ratios are they showing related to revenue. And this is one I really want you to add from your business breakdown. Listen to your business breakdown you're going to listen to it again, being you know much more specifically. Listen for things related to revenue growth. What are they doing to try to get more revenue into this company? Uh, how did Chipotle do this week? Some of you are doing Chipotle. Any jump there? So they announced 
revenue. Pretty strong, a little bit off today, but a really big jump yesterday. Um, is that related to revenue? Usually you see a big jump like that. You have to just see when a stock reports its earnings, there's two things the market looks at, revenue and earnings. Are revenues beating expectations or earnings beating expectations? Sometimes firms beat on revenue, but miss on earnings. Sometimes they miss on revenue, beat on earnings, sometimes beat on both. And it's really something you can almost not even predict how the market's going to react. So if I see a big jump like that, Disney and Chipotle, they're mainly going to react to either the revenue or earnings. It's usually not liquidity or solvency. It's usually revenue or earnings. So revenue is about turnover. Earnings is about turnover plus margins. So you have to look at margins. So there's a lot of things to look like. So when I see a firm really jump like that, it's like, what is the market reacting to? All right, so let's get into Walmart. So the first thing you do is not, doesn't have a chart. That's why a lot of students, I think probably a fifth of the students last year left this out of their exam because there's no chart. Since they didn't have a chart, they didn't think that. So highlight it because it's the easiest one. So revenue growth for Walmart was only 2.81%. That seems pretty weak. And that's even with a huge jump they got for COVID. They got a 6% jump for COVID. Um, and even then, over time, they've only grown. You know, that's barely faster than inflation. So they're not growing that fast. And it gets worse because, and we'll see it down below, their revenues grew 2%, but their square feet grew 2%. You would think if they added 2% square feet that the revenue would be up 2% plus inflation. Wouldn't that make sense? You added 2% more stores and inflation, you should be up 4 4 4.5%. They're only up 2.8%. What's going on? What's the deal with this, with this company? So what could Walmart do to get more customers? I think we talked a little bit about it. Their big advantage of Amazon is all their stores. So curbside pickup. Are they doing any home delivery like HEB? Have y'all seen any home delivery? Do they? Is it a Walmart marked vehicle? Because I haven't noticed any. I see the HEB ones all over the place. Yeah. Just on the app, it'll just say like yeah. Do you know who delivers it? Is it Walmart people? Because they could use you know Uber or somebody else. Yeah, I think they outsource it to like Uber or something. Or DoorDash. Or What's the, uh, the favorite Instacart, Instacart or whatever Instacart, it is? Yeah, Instacart. I never use any of those. Well, that's the big issue. Now, whoever's doing Chipotle, Chipotle does a lot of DoorDash, but DoorDash really hurts their margins. So you have to really ask, okay, DoorDash is going to help their turnover, but that's an additional cost they have to bear. That's going to hurt their margins. You have to really look at the, the full picture there. Um, so there's things Walmart is an impressive firm. There's things they can do to get more traffic. Um, but there's not obvious things other than building more stores. So not strong. You got to pick your word, your word. Let's look at, um, Dolby and y'all tell me what words you might use for Dolby. Revenues growth 3.4. How does that sound? It's better than inflation, but not much. The word anemic might be a little weak, but hey, so it might be too basic. decent might be okay i don't know so get your thesaurus out try to avoid using the word anemic don't use word like tremendous or spectacular you know, you know make sure it fits the numbers what would be spectacular 20 percent. well over 10 double digits definitely i would think in this environment eight percent would be pretty strong um but yeah you have to pick it's subjective but you kind of look at that and just see you know what what makes sense um, all right, the second one's real important. Remember on the rubric, I had this as marked one of the most difficult ones. I actually think it's one of the most important ones. This is somewhat the first thing I do. So what we're gonna do here, let's practice it a little bit because this is really, really important. We're talking about revenue growth versus capacity. 
But we want to know what is the source of the revenue growth? Is it better turnover or added capacity? Where is their growth coming? So for Walmart, added capacity is new stores or square feet. You can grow your, your revenues by just adding more stores, but that's a really expensive way to add revenues. Every store is, I don't know how many millions of dollars. It's a lot of training. It's a lot of work. That's a hard way to add revenue. Better turnover is more revenue per store or square feet. If you can get more revenue, but you don't have to add any square feet, that's a wonderful thing because you got revenue and you didn't have to put all that money into it. So for a company like EA that's digital assets, would that be more like? So for EA, I would be looking at employees. So to add more employees, here I'm looking at revenue per employee. Huh? Disney still employee. Yeah, you don't have much story. Yours is just... You just have to kind of go through the motion of doing that analysis, but it's you, know, you could admit in your paper there's there's not a really good one to use. Revenue per employee would be well would work well for some of their subsidiaries. Yeah. Revenue for PPE probably would work well for their uh, their theme parks and cruise lines. Cruise lines it really is revenue per birth, but we can't break it up. That's one of the downsides of conglomerates is they're really really hard to analyze. You almost have to analyze all the individual biz businesses. Um, all right, so now here's one trick you got to watch. If you do revenue per square foot for employees, those are non-dollar factors. If you do revenue per PP and E, that is a dollar factor. Square feet is not in dollars, employees is not in dollars, but sharpening plant equipment is in dollars. Now, why is that important? Where here, if it's not in dollars, you would expect growth at least equal to inflation. All right, so if you're dividing by employees, by square feet, and their growth rate's 1%, you can say, hey, that's not even keeping up with inflation, all right? If you're doing revenue per PP and E, zero is keeping up with inflation. And why is that? Because they're both in dollars. Revenues in dollars, PP and E is in dollars. They both go up with inflation. So if someone's doing revenue per PP and E and the growth is 0.5%, you don't say, well, they're not keeping up with inflation because your numerator and denominator and numerator, they're both in dollars. Inflation's in both numbers. But if you're doing revenue per employer square feet and it's the growth rate's only 1%, then you can say, hey, they're not even keeping up with inflation. Questions on that? If the revenue per, per PPE has a negative growth rate? Yeah, I mean, that, that's negative is always bad. But... Um, just be careful, you know, if the growth rate's only 1% on PP&E, don't say they're not keep up inflation because they actually are plus an extra 1%. So revenue per PP&E zero just means they're doing well, they're keeping track. They're adding 10% more PP&E, but they're adding 10% more revenue. Both of those are inflation, but that's not true here. You add 10% more employees, you would expect your revenue growth 12%. The 10% you're getting from your extra employees plus an extra 2% because of inflation, all right? So it does matter what statistic you use, whether it's in dollars or not, how you're going to frame the inflation discussion. So let's look at Walmart. Important with, now, there's some words in here you may not need in yours. With any retail business, y'all aren't all doing retail business. I don't think uh, Peyton, I would use retail business for Ferrari. <laughs> so, you know, pick, pick your term here to assess whether this growth is coming from increased turnover or increased capacity. Look at Walmart's growth in revenue per square feet and growth in square feet. You notice how those add up almost exactly to the 2.8% growth in revenue. So are they getting some improvement in turnover? Yes, they are, because here's the turnover revenue per square foot. 
but it's just barely keeping up with inflation. Their square feet is growing, but not dramatically. Um, so we see some growth coming in improvement in turnover. That's that 1.88%. Though neither is showing particularly robust growth. All right. Now be real careful here. Some students get hooked on, it's good if this number is bigger than this number. And that's, that's not really the case. The case is this number, revenue per square foot, is that a good number? So we can we can work some scenarios and let's just see. So employee growth. Five point three percent revenue per employee. is three point one percent. So they have really high growth in employees They're adding a lot of employees. How are the employees doing? They're doing okay. You know, if inflation is 2%, they're adding, you're getting more revenue with inflation, plus they're adding extra 1.1. So we're getting some improvement. It's not great, we're getting some. If employee growth was minus 1.3 and revenue per employee was 4.1, what is that? Right. They've been re reducing their employees. That may be giving you some concern. Why are they doing that? But they may have found some new system where they can do more with fewer employees. And the employees they have left are doing a good job generating sales. That looks really strong. So the overall revenue growth would be what? About 2.8%. Um, but they got 2% growth in revenue, even though they cut their employee force by 1.3. So they're obviously getting much better at using the employees they have. What if, what if uh, let's do square feet. Square feet growth, let's say, is 4%. And revenue per square feet, I don't know who could actually do this, was 8.1%. That looks pretty good. They're, they're adding more square feet, and you want them to do that because they're getting a lot more money out of those square feet. So they need to take advantage of that business. <laughs> What if square feet grows 3%, but revenue per square feet grows 1.1%? So they're growing the business. It's not massive, but they're growing the business. But the business they're growing is barely keeping up with inflation. And there you can say inflation because it's square feet. It's not in dollars. All right. So you notice I never said this is bad because it's less than that. The 1.1 is bad because it's less than 3%. You don't say that. The 1.1 doesn't have to be related three percent especially if they're growing their square feet at 30 percent and their revenue per square foot is growing 11 that's tremendous that's wonderful the fact that 11's work lower than 30 it doesn't mean anything it's a completely bogus number we're just trying to figure out their revenues grow 41 percent or they're growing the business no question but in growing the business they're still getting more foot traffic in their existing business more customers are coming in sounds like a great business that's what you, I don't know what business that would be, but whoever it is, they're doing a good job. Maybe this is um, Orange Theory. I've out been the Orange Theory. I know what that is mm -hmm. in this place. It's interesting, right? They say they got a, they have a unique thing. I don't know how they make their money and how that's all broken up, but their shops are not that big in square feet and how they manage that. I don't, you know, you know it's interesting, but that's how you understand a business. Are they adding new stores? And if they are, is it impacting their revenue per, per store in a way that you know is harming the business or helping the business? So for Walmart, I don't give them great scores. They're not adding tremendous amount of stores, but they're there's you know their revenue is just growing essentially barely with inflation and with the growth in stores. It's just not a tremendously high growing business. What else might you think about Walmart that could influence this numbers? So are y'all buying stuff at Walmart online? As I've heard some students say they buy it online and go pick it up. If you buy it online and pick it up, is that revenue per store or is that an internet sell? Would you give, you know, if you're the manager of that, would you give that revenue to the store you pick it up at? Or would, you know, how would you manage that? So that's something you have to think about. Um, now, Lululemon, or let's take Apple. Do you buy your Apple products at an Apple store? 
my last Apple phone I got from AT&T. Um, so when you have a firm or a lot of the sales is online, you have to really kind of figure that out. What is What does that mean? I don't know about Lululemon. Do you buy Lululemon online and it mail it to you? Has that happened or not? You can, I think. I don't, yeah, I don't shop there. You can, but I think a lot of people like to try it on. Try it on. But they're doing more men's and children. It's possible men don't care. It's like, you know, okay. send me whatever. I don't know. I don't, I'm not, I'm too cheap to buy Lou Lemon stuff, but, um, but the online side is, is interesting because the square feet almost don't matter in that case. So, you know, you have to kind of think through your business and what, what they actually do. And then you do a chart on it. So here I left the 9.9% .9 in mainly because that's Costco. And I just wanted to kind of see that Walmart's very much in line with the industry, not massive growth here. That's that. Revenue per square foot, 1.88% growth, but the whole industry is seen not tremendous amount. So in line with the industry, slightly improving these last few years, but that's probably some COVID stuff going on there. Um, it's not a strong, strong story. It's not a disastrous story. It's not like they're, because, in, you know, you see the Amazon effect where they were just flat for years. At least it's coming up. The other thing, and if I were really doing Walmart, the other thing with Walmart is they're growing really rapidly in Central and South America. I'd want to know the stories down there. What What is the revenue per store in those those countries? What's their margins? Those things would be really interesting to me. So I'd love to be able to do this U.S. versus non-U.S. and break it up and see what I could get. If you can find the data, it's hard to find the data sometimes to see. So if a fir firm is really changing their business, they're moving overseas or whatever, yeah, you want to look at that. Costco is a good example. Costco is really a U.S. only, and they've got some really good competitors in Central and South America. I've seen the, is it Price Smart? Have you ever been to a Price Smart? Seems like a really good business. I see those in Costa Rica. Could Costco go overseas? Could they go to Canada? Would that be a good business model for them? Uh, how would that work or would that be a disaster? So anytime a firm is going to have some major shift, especially internationally, you want to ask, how is that going to affect their revenue per store or for square foot? Um, so this part right here, you're going to have to probably delete this paragraph entirely and and rewrite it for your company. Now, if you're doing Costco, I have students that say, well, this applies to Costco. Not really, because Costco's revenue per square foot has done really, really well. And I'm saying Walmart's pretty pathetic, so you can't leave the pathetic in there if you're doing Costco because they're doing so. Make sure you read it and say, does this really apply to my firm? Don't say, well, I picked Costco, so I can just leave that paragraph in there. No, you need to, you need to re rewrite it. And Carson, don't have the Amazon effect in your paper. It's probably not there. All right, so that's the second one. Let's, let's look at Dolby and see if we can figure out Dolby. So what with Dolby, what revenue... Statistic turnover ratio would you use? Revenue per square foot? When's the last time you went to a Dolby store? Revenue per PP&E? Maybe you could look at their PP&E, maybe not. Probably revenue per employee. It's that kind of high tech kind of firm that probably has those kind of employees. So let's look at it. Their employee growth is 4%. That's a pretty hefty increase in employees, 4%. They used to have 1.6 million employees. Now they have 2.3, or maybe that's 2,000 employees. That's probably 2,000. 1,500 employees, now they have 2,000. Their revenue per employee has actually just been flat. Not too impressive. The other thing you want to look at is see, is there something going on year by year by year? You notice how volatile they are? That's pretty unusual, isn't it? If you look at that revenue per employee, It doesn't look volatile. Well, it kind of looks volatile here. They're very strong, but they're also very flat. So they're not improving. So whatever employees are adding, those employees are not adding additional revenue. They're kind of just flat. So, so you give them a strong score that they're really strong. You give them a weak score and that they're not getting any better. They started at 600000 per employee, and they're essentially still there. Now, should that grow with inflation or not? So the revenue per employee 
shrunk by 0.18 percent. Does so that be up at least with inflation? It's revenue per employee. You'd hope it would be because employees are not dollars, right? So you'd expect that at least for a two percent just for inflation. So it's a worse worse number than it looks. Um, property plant equipment 522 versus total assets. So I don't think revenue per PP it's it's like 25% of their assets. You could use it, but it's it's probably not a great number for a firm like that. It looks even worse though, if you look at it. It's actually declined. So when I see something like this, their property plant equipment is growing pretty fast, but the revenue per is down. I'm, my question is what assets does this firm actually buy? Are they are you buying buildings, uh, machinery? I, I don't know if y'all are familiar with the firm. I think it's a region firm that, that builds the big chip machinery. Um, those things cost, I, I forget, it's ridiculous, the massive number. Um, so when Intel or these firms buy those things, that's a massive people, piece of equipment. You know, that's pretty important. Uh, you'd want to know that's what they're purchasing and why. I don't know what Adobe purchases. I think they produce a lot of hardware. They're producing speakers and those kind of things. So they probably have a manufacturing function. So that would be important. Are they building warehouses? What exactly are they doing? But again, it's very volatile. Their PP&E has actually dropped since 2019. But over time, it's so it's all over the place. So they're doing some interesting things that you would probably want to do more research if you had the time to get into it. <clears throat> all right. So here, higher is better versus the industry is better. And then you want to compare it to total revenue growth, revenue growth. 2.81%, some coming from better turnover, but essentially in line with inflation, so nothing spectacular going on there. No exciting story for Walmart. It's not a disaster, but it's not a great story. You would think they'd be a little stronger on revenue per square feet than other stores. It'd be interesting to see a firm like Family Dollar. Do you think they have higher or lower revenue per square foot? Their prices are real low, so that kind of brings it down, but then they're really strict. I mean, which seems more claustrophobic to you, a Walmart or a Family Dollar? Family Dollars are pretty, and I don't know what their warehouse function is, how they have stuff show up, you know, their whole margin, their whole inventory management. I don't know how they do that, but it'd be interesting to contrast those two stores and see who's, who's stronger on that. And then the last one's pretty easy. You just show the turnover ratio. And again, higher is better. Costco is going to be at the top on that. Walmart's pretty strong on asset turnover. And it's probably because even though their revenue per square foot is pretty average, their stores are pretty, pretty, pretty efficiently built. So their cost to build a store per square foot is probably cheaper than the competitors. I think Costco even more so. The huge advantage Costco has is Costco's stores are also their warehouses. And that's a tremendous benefit for them. They don't have a lot of wasted real estate. So they're really, really strong on that as well. Um, but here, they're strong, but flat again. Some improvement since 2020, but no, nothing really, really that massive. So third, Walmart's asset turnover was well above the industry. This is expected given that it's a deep discount retailer. Both Walmart industry have had flat turnover. Though uh, they hit a, a decade high asset turnover 251 here, so they they are the highest they've been in the last 10 years. It's not massive, but it is much higher. And this next paragraph, you'll probably have to completely re rewrite that one. Some of these paragraphs, uh, this is where I want you to incorporate as much as you can from your business breakdown. This is the perfect place. These overall summaries at the end of turnover, at the end of margin, that's where business, business breakdown is going to help you the most. So have your ears tuned to turnover versus margin. Are they talking about turnover or are they talking about margin? So a good example, Tyson Foods. Tyson Foods had an article where they're going to start enhancing the meats. So adding sauces and other things. So you can essentially buy it, put it in the oven, you have a meal. All right. So they're going to charge a lot more for that. So is that a turnover or is that a margin? Well, it's turnover trying to sell more of their stuff. If it's a margin, if they're going to sell the same stuff, they're going to get a much higher margin because they're going to put more stuff into it. So which is it? If you read what the CEO is saying, it was both. They're trying to reach a new market, a bunch of people who don't like to you know, cook, cook meals. They just want it prepared. So that's a, that's a whole new area people that are busy working long hours so yeah they're going to sell so they have a new market 
but they're also getting much bigger margins on those because they add another two dollars to the product, but they charge an extra six dollars. It's both at the same time. And so you're listening to that. So it's possible it could be both. Possible, but sometimes it's just one thing that they're really focusing on. They're focused on revenue growth. So listen real carefully. What is the focus of management in, in doing that? Uh, is interesting with Cinnabon. Their first store didn't have much room, so they put the oven up front and they got great foot traffic. The second store, they said, hey, we got more room. Let's put the oven in the back. And what did they discover? Much lower turnover. Why? You couldn't smell it. You couldn't smell it. They discovered smell was a big part of their product, so they moved all their ovens up front. Yeah, they, they learned from their own business. Um, I've never bought a Cinnabon in my life. I like the way Cat Cole says it. Um, from a marketing, you should listen to if you're a marketing major because she understands marketing. You see, she says we're not gonna we're not gonna make a healthy product. So her thing is, if you're gonna be bad, make it good. And that's what I said. This is unhealthy. It's horrible for you, but it's better than any under, any other unhealthy thing you eat. We got them beat. This is great. So that smell is really important to them. You know, they got to make sure people know. I'm, I'm and to me, if I'm in a an airport and my flight gets delayed, calories no longer count. I can eat whatever I want to because the airline has forced me to sit there and eating is the one thing I can enjoy while I'm sitting in an airport. I, but I still haven't given in to the uh, Cinnabon. How many calories in a Cinnabon? Not much. Too much? Y'all know? Probably like 800. It's more than that. Does it tell you? I don't know. It doesn't tell you a lot. Oh, Cinnabon. Yeah, eight, 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 eight. is not <laughs> not that bad. I wouldn't think. Like, that's just the class. Like it crumbles. Look at like eight eighty is not bad, boy. I, I I could do that. I was thinking like fourteen hundred. Yeah, so, but she understands her business. They're not going to go out and create a healthy product and sell. That's just not their thing. So she understands her business. And she talks a lot about turnover because it's a franchise business. And they also did um, uh, these partnerships with Burger King and Slotsky's. And she talked about the asset turnover on that and how that asset turnover may be harming the asset turnover franchises. And she talked about how nine or not um, how uh, COVID shut down airports, harmed their business, and how they're doing. So she's really, I mean, it's almost like she's teaching a finance classes. She's really got the insight into all this. So that's the way CEOs talk. The CEOs understand their business. They understand turnover versus margin and the combination. Sometimes they improve turnover, but it might hurt margin. But if you can improve turnover and help margin, like McDonald's did with offering breakfast, that's that's a huge win for your stockholders. All right, so I'm trying to help you with the with the uh, business breakdowns, what to listen to. All right, any questions on turnover? Three things on turnover. Anybody remember the three things on turnover without looking it up? You start with the easy one, which is? Uh, revenue. revenue growth, right? Is it 2%, is it 8%? The second thing you're looking at? Revenue growth. Yeah, revenue per something. So you're looking at uh, turnover versus capacity, right? And then the third thing, asset turnover. Asset turnover. Just look at asset turnover. Yeah. All right, good. good. Okay. So I have a question. So Ferrari has uh, the CAGR for revenue six percent, but has a negative revenue per employee. How would you interpret? That? If you do employees, that um, there could. It could be it could be something that they're hiring new employees for something unusual that they're going to get a benefit in the future. And that's possible. A good example of like Cisco Foods. Cisco Foods hired a lot of new salespeople. The year they did that, it's going to look terrible because they just got them in place. But the next few years, you're hoping. So you'd like to say, okay, I, I see a one year decline because they hired a lot of new salespeople, but they better start producing next few years. So I'm expecting that to come back up. Well, because I did some research and it turns out that like half of Ferrari's revenue comes from actually merchandise sales. Oh, really? Yeah. Like like, t-shirts and things? Half of it? Yeah, wow. Half of oh. it. Uh, for, uh, this article that Ferrari produced said about uh, half of their, around 
They have four billion dollars in revenue per year, but two billion came from. Virginia. Where do they sell those? Like, uh, just like branded caps, flags, high and luxury. But in a, like not in a Walmart though. I mean, mm -hmm. they must have select retail outlets. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I can't answer why in their case. Um, you might look at revenue per PPE and see it's the same story. It can get frustrating. Where revenue for employees coming down, or revenue for PPE is going up. Are they buying fewer assets and using more employees? You know, that's the kind of thing you have to kind of think about. I mean, you think about an HEB, I don't know how successful it is, but you have these self checkout lines. So you have fewer employees, but you have more assets. You know, it's possible that, that one could impact the other. I'm not just confident. <laughs> I know when um, my airlines is united, so they went to kiosk. So they have all these machines. But they have the same number of employees standing up there helping us on the kiosk. And I was like, I don't know what the benefit of this is. It seems like it's the same, you know, more capital expenditures with the same employees doesn't sound all that wonderful. But think through your business. What are they doing? Why are they hiring more employees? Why aren't those employees why aren't those employees producing revenue? You know, it's the kind of question you have to figure out. Yeah. So for turnover, you have the big three things you want us to cover, revenue growth and then for revenue per something, like would I do revenue per employee? Because then they kind of yeah, revenue employee would probably be the best revenue. Assets, but I mean, look at property, plant, equipment, okay. and asset turnover is just asset turnover. Right. Yeah, you just look at it. Um, I gave you a chart at the bottom that shows asset turnover, and it, you know, you know, I don't like CAGRs of ratios, but I gave it to you just so you can get the trend. I don't like to say revenue per Asset turnover is up 0.86% CAGR. It's just strange for me to do a CAGR of a ratio. I like to do CAGRs of dollars or employees, but of a ratio is kind of strange. But it's still there to just show it has improved, but not dramatically. All right, so let's talk margins. <clears throat> margins. So... Anytime, okay, so remember asset turnover, when you see that ratio, you're going to start with the revenue and divide by something. With margin, anytime you see the word margin, you're going to divide by revenue, right? Turnover revenue is on the top, margins, revenue is on the bottom, okay? Unfortunately, there's a lot of margins in finance and accounting over oh, so sloppy on this. So gross margin is usually pretty straightforward. That's revenue minus your cost of goods sold. Some people call that the markup. So that's really, that's what you're looking to see. Is this a high market product like Tiffany's or is this a low market product like Costco's? So thin margins or wide margins. <clears throat> Not every business has a gross margin. I'm in the insurance business. We kind of have one, but we don't call it gross margin. Banks do not have gross margin. Anybody know what a bank calls theirs? It's a really famous ratio in banking with the word margin in it. No one knows. I'll give you the initials. You know what that is? If you're interviewing with the bank, you'd want to know what this number is for your bank. So net interest margin. What is that? That's the interest they're getting on their loans minus interest they're paying on their savings account. It's a very different type of margin. That's why none of y'all could pick a financial services company because the, the margin side, especially, and the turnover. Banks don't have turnover. It doesn't make any sense for a bank, nor do insurance companies. So there are some things we're doing that don't work at all for banks and insurance companies. But even banks have to turn margin. They have a net interest margin. So gross margin, there what you're looking for is just how profitable is the product before they do, you know, their staff functions, their procurement, their marketing, all those other things. Um, there are high margin businesses and there are low margins businesses. This is where the brand value comes in. If you have a really good brand brand value, you should have really good, strong gross margins. <clears throat> so obviously Walmart's going to have a thin margin here. Like, oh, well, who knows? We'll see what the numbers are. It can be a much thinner uh, Ferrari is going to have a huge gross margin. We'll have to see. Hey, we're going to get to your gross margin and see what it is. A firm like Microsoft has massive gross margins. It's like 80, 90%. I mean, almost, there's almost no cost of goods sold. For some businesses, this is extremely critical. For, for a firm like Lululemon or Chipotle, Costco, Walmart, gross margins are very, very important. Kroger's, very, very important. Kroger's stock has fluctuated dramatically because of gross margins because 
of the inflation scare these last few years, grocery stores were seeing that gross margin getting cut and people were focusing really closely on that. But there's a problem, okay? Accounting measures, I want you to solve this problem. So y'all tell me, how much of the discussion did y'all have on cost of goods sold in your accounting class? And if not, your accounting majors, don't tell them I said this, but you need to pressure your accounting professors. So someone's doing Chipotle. Who's doing Chipotle? Hey, Luke, so what is in cost of goods sold for Chipotle? What about the, the ground beef? That would be the chicken, the lettuce. What about the paper products? Cups, plates, napkins, would that be in there? Probably so. What about the hourly workers? Yeah, it's getting a little tricky, right? Accounting is not all that clear what goes into a cost of goods sold. What goes in cost of goods sold for Microsoft? They have it. Software. Is it, you know, is it servers? What actually goes in that number? So here's Chipotle. Their cost of revenue. Really thin margin, right? Their cost of revenue is seven billion. Their revenues is nine point five billion. So their gross margins not it's not it's gonna be a pretty small number, but that's a huge number. They must have a lot of workers in that number. Probably all of their hourly workers are in that number. You would think, because how where would where would they be if they're not there? You compare that to Microsoft. And look at that, 228 billion versus 68. But then why does the cost of goods for my, I would want to know that. I want to see that number. How many employees are in that number? And is that almost entirely employees? Or do they have servers in there? You know, I have so many different businesses going on. Who knows what's all in those numbers? So we don't spend enough time in that in accounting, really understanding so can you compare four companies on their cost of revenue? Can you compare McDonald's to a Jack in the Box of Sonic on their cost of goods sold? McDonald's is interesting because it's a franchise. So what is McDonald's cost of goods sold? Is it the actual hamburgers that they're making? Or is there something else going on with the franchise? So it can get really tricky. I'm not asking y'all to go through all of that, but do think about it. What is actually in my cost of goods sold? If your firm has inventory, that's obvious. You know, if you're buying stuff and then reselling it like a Costco or Walmart, obviously that's your cost of goods sold. But does Walmart put any of its hourly workers into its cost of goods sold or is it just the stuff they're selling? If Chipotle is putting hourly workers in cost of goods sold, you would think Walmart would as well, but which ones? Or are some hourly workers they don't put in cost of goods sold? So it can get really, really tricky. One thing you absolutely hope is that they're consistent over time so that you can compare it over time. But I'm not so sure you can compare a McDonald's to a Chipotle to a Jack in a Box, especially when you have franchise versus non-franchise. But that's your gross margin. You would hope you would hope a Chipotle would have a higher gross margin than a McDonald's, but who knows, given the franchise. The net margins where it gets really, really messy. So there's so many different ways you can create a net margin. You can use earnings for interest and taxes. You can do EBITDA, earnings for interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. Some people say profit margin. I don't like profit margin because it's not well-defined. It could be net income. It could be EBIT, EBIT beforehand. My least favorite of all is operating margin. I'm not really sure what that means. For most firms, when I've seen that, it's EBITDA. E-B-I-T-D-A is what they use for operating margin, but not everybody's consistent. So I don't like that phrase. So if you're going to use a margin, and I don't, I think I messed up on this in your file. If you're going to use a margin, I don't like net margin. I like to actually say EBIT or EBITDA margin in the title, just, just so people know exactly what my margin is. So I was sloppy here. I think I did an EBIT margin, but I can never remember there either. Um, net margin. It's going to have to be EBIT because of the uh, a C5. Yeah, I'm using EBIT, so we're using EBIT margin. You have to when you're doing the ROE decomposition because EBITDA doesn't work in that analysis. But I should have put EBIT margin. 
Um, any of these work, net income is essentially profit margin. My favorite is Ibit. Some people like Ibit dogs, just kind of depends. Um, that's your net margin. There are firms out there that have amazing net margins like a Microsoft and there's firms that have amazing low net margins. Let's see if I can show this to you. I think I have this file from a prior semester. We'll use the spreadsheet later in the class, but um, I need to update it. And I'm waiting to update it because it takes forever to update. Right. So in this file, come on, come on. I have net and gross margins of a lot of companies, 3,000 companies. Uh huh. I'm trying to figure out if your net margins are like respectable or not. Are you looking at your revenues mostly? Well, you're going to look at it versus competitors. That's the main thing. Um, all right, let's let's look at Costco. Costco is one of my favorite companies. So here's Costco's gross margins. This is their gross margins. 12%, 12%, 12 and a half, 12 and a half, 12.3, 12, 12, 12.8, 12 12.5, 12 12.4. 12 up to 13. But for most firms, gross margins are going to be very, very, very steady. It's very unusual to see our like how hard would it be to forecast Costco's gross margin? You could probably get pretty close, couldn't you? Somewhere between 12 and 13%. But if you think that's stable, look at this. This is their net margin. 3%, Anybody want to guess what their net margin is going to be next year? I would guess 3%. Very, very, very stable net margins. And I love the CEO. I think he's just retired of Costco, but he makes an amazing statement. I might have told we may have talked about this earlier, but but he says our goal is to make as little money as possible. How many want your CEO to say that? What is he saying? They want a three percent margin. If they find a way to save a billion dollars, they cut their prices and they send that all to their customers. So, what is Costco's number one focus? Customer. It's on turnover. They want massive turnover and they want 3% margins. I love that about a business. If we can cut costs, we're going to give it to the customers so that our competition can't keep up with us. And we're going to constantly find ways to cut costs. And there are investors that complain. Why can't you Why can't you give us a little bit more margin? He's like, no, we're 3% margin. That's what we do. Very, very, very stable. Now you compare that to uh, Tesla. If I can spell Tesla. I know Tesla's in here. T S L A. So their gross margins went from 88% to negative 7%. 8%, 26, 30, 7. You want to guess the next year? 22, you want to guess the next year? 13. 27, now it's getting a little more stable, right? Because they're they're getting it, but even then it's coming down. Those are ridiculously high margins for an auto company. Now, I don't know what Peyton, what Ferrari is. I don't, Ferrari's not in this file. But if you look at a Ford, oh, there's going to be too many of them. I ah, forget it. Let's find Ford. Now, Ford's a little tricky because of Ford Motor Credit. And it does mess up, um, does mess up the numbers. But notice to be much lower than Tesla, right? Tesla was in the 20, 22 range. Ford's more in the single digit, maybe 11% range. So 
Ford has much lower gross margins than Tesla. That gives Tesla a huge, huge advantage. Look at their net margins, just all over the place, right? Not a very profitable business. Um, just flying all over the place. So very volatile. So you saw Costco 3% forever, Ford's all over the place. It's a different business. Um, so margin is a big part of the, the turnover versus margin. So Costco, it's all about turnover. They're going to get that turnover as high as they can, and then they're going to keep their margins very flat, very predictable. Um, every business low there, Ferrari, their whole focus is on margins. They're not out going having a sell. You know, we got a car for 150,000 bucks, you know, $20,000 off. That, that's not what they're doing. They're selling to billionaires. Billionaires don't, don't want to sell. The last thing you want to say is, hey, I got a discount on this car. They want to brag that, hey, I paid an extra 50000 just to get, uh, I forget what they say they put in their cars, some strange things that rich people want in their cars. People brag about paying more. So their focus is on is on margin. That's their business. Um, all right. So if you go back to the notes, um, gross margin versus net margin. Gross margin is about the pricing strategy. Is this a discount store? Is this a firm that's providing some special high branded product? So that's your markup. Depending on what you think is in cost of goods sold. The second one is the overall profitability of the business. How profitable is this business? How good are they at managing their expenses? Walmart's all about expense management. Costco's all about expense management. That's in there. That's how they tell their employees. They're always looking for ways to cut expenses, cut costs. Um, their pricing power, uh, that's part of the gross margin, but the net margins can be impacted that as well because you know you saw Costco had low gross margins, which also means they have low net margins. But here's the most important one. We'll probably spend a little bit more time on this. And this is this concept of operating leverage. So there's two leverages, operating leverage and financial leverage. We already talked about financial leverage. That's the debt, how much debt the firm has. The more debt they have, the higher their return is going to be, but also the more volatile they're going to be. We'll, we'll look at that. Operating leverage is the amount of fixed costs that they have. So debt is kind of a fixed cost. You have to pay your debt holders every year, no matter what. But it's related to your financing. Operating leverage is all your other fixed costs that you have. The higher the fixed costs you have, the more volatile the firm is going to be. Your earnings are going to be. Because if you have a really, really great year, your revenues shoot up 20% and your fixed costs stay the same, your profitability is going to shoot up. But the same way, if you have a bad year, like a recession, your revenues fall, you have those same fixed costs, you're going to lose a lot. So firms with really high fixed costs are much more volatile than firms with a lot of variable costs. So higher fixed costs is going to mean when revenues change, their earnings are going to change a whole lot more. You can see a lot more volatility, like a Ford. Ford has a lot of fixed costs because they have a union. They have a lot of employee benefits they got to pay every year, no matter what. So if their revenues fall 2%, you might see their, their profitability fall 10% because it's very, very levered. So operating leverage is a form of leverage that makes the firm more risky, just like more debt makes them more risky. Now, where do you find operating leverage in the financial statements? And it, it's just not there. You can't go and find fixed costs. So it's really, really hard to find. Have y'all had contribution margin yet? Does that sound familiar? Break even points, you'll have it. And have y'all had management accounting? Contribution mm -hmm. margin, that's sound familiar. Your break even point, your variable costs, and all that. So I love that analysis. If I was starting a new business, I would use it. That's practically impossible analysis out of USA. What is USA's fixed costs and variable costs? We don't, we really don't know. <laughs> it's really tough. Now, McDonald's, does McDonald's have variable costs? Definitely, their cost of goods sold is pretty variable. If they sell 20 more hamburgers, they're going to have 20, 20 more you know, uh, beef patties they got to cost. Your employees, hourly workers, is that variable? That's pretty variable. It's not perfectly variable. You don't tell a worker, hey, can you come in from 11.59 to 12.47 and take off and then come back? You know, They're going to be there when you don't have more revenues because you just have to have, you can't have workers come and go constantly. But it's pretty variable. If you know you have a big day coming up, you can have more workers come in. And so those costs will go up. 
But most costs are not perfectly variable. Now, if you work at men's warehouse and you pay commissions, commissions are about the most variable costs you have. So you, you pay your workers 10% of revenue. That's a very variable cost. So fixed costs, what kind of fixed costs do you have? Well, if you have salaried employees, that's going to be a fixed cost. So a pharmaceutical has a lot of scientists. That's going to be a very fixed cost. Um, how many hourly workers do you think USAA has? I don't know if they have any. If they do, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of them. So most of USA's employees are fixed costs. Now, if their revenues drop, will they cut those employees? Yeah, but it's in a pretty, pretty slow lag. You don't say, hey, our revenues are down 2%, cut 2% of our employees. They're not going to do that. If after over time they can see their revenues are down, yeah, they may lay off some workers, but it's going to be a pretty slow slog. Most costs are either step, step variable or step fix. They're kind of fixed for a range, but they, they do move generally with revenues. That's like the hourly worker, hourly worker. It's going to generally go with revenues, but not exactly second by second. And then step fix costs, is they're pretty fixed, but at some point your revenues grow so much you have to add a new warehouse. Are you know so there's sometimes where it's fixed, fixed, but eventually your revenues grow so much you have to put more money into it, and so they jump up. So most costs are what we call mix, and this is why accountants. Uh, you can debate me on this, but have y'all have heard of ABC? Haven't you? Are y'all talking ABC in your accounting classes? What yeah. what was ABC stand for? Activity-based activity -based costing. Does it work? Are you accounting professors talking about it? Ten years ago, it was going to save the world. Are they still saying that? So it's tough. The reason it's tough is it's just really hard for people to sign their time and doing this. So when I was running mutual funds at USA, they gave me this ABC, and they told me what percentage of your time did you spend on this mutual fund? What percentage did you spend on this time? How much did you spend on the property and casualty stock portfolio? And I'm just making numbers up. Because I didn't spend time on that mutual fund. I spent time in my job, and then whatever I did was put into that mutual fund. So I say, hey, we want to buy more of this and less of that. We just put it in all the mutual funds. How would I put my time on each one of those? So what I did is I just made numbers up, and then the next month, I made sure the numbers I made up were real consistent with the previous made-up numbers because I didn't want to have big shifts. It's tough. An actuary, Gabrielle, you mean actuary. You asked an actuary, which products did you work on? It's like, well, I worked on all of them. Well, what percentage on this one? Well, I'm doing an actuarial job. It affects all the products equally at the same time. It's really, really tough to do. There are very few jobs where you're just so obvious you're working on this product for this amount of time. It's tough. ABC is just so, so, so difficult. I do think it's extremely important to understand that. One of the most important things firms do is the cost of a new customer. Business Breakdown does a good job of that. How much does it cost you to get a new customer to come home? How much does it cost Netflix to get a new customer? What are they doing to get new customers? Those are important, but they're very, very tough. So I'm, I applaud accounting for trying to do this. I think they have a task that's practically impossible because firms are just so, so difficult. But how will it show up? And this is how I think it will show up. Firms that have fixed costs should have very volatile net margins. Firms that have a lot of variable costs should have very flat net margins. So I'm going to kind of arguing that Costco has a lot of variable costs and low fixed costs because their net margins are so stable. Whereas Ford has a lot of fixed costs because their margins are fairly volatile. So that's my argument on that. The other thing is elasticity of the man. Have y'all had that in your eco class? What is elasticity of the man? Price elasticity. Yeah. Yeah, have y'all heard that term yeah. before? Yeah. So if I increase my price 2%, and my volumes grow fall 10%, is that highly elastic or low elastic? Very elastic, right? They're very sensitive to the price. So if I increase my prices 2%, my volumes fall 0.1%, that's inelastic. So what do you do there? You increase your prices, right? You're selling cigarettes, you increase your prices. They're going to buy it no matter what. But if you're really sensitive, an increase in price is going to cause volumes to fall more. So I'm going to argue that firms that have very elastic, very elastic demand that they're going to see volatile gross margins. Their customers are really sensitive to the price changes. But firms that don't have a lot of price elasticity, their gross margins are going to be much, much more stable. So a grocery store has very stable margins because if coffee prices go up, they raise their coffee prices. Their customers don't complain. 
right? If coffee prices go up, you don't go protest HEB. You just know coffee prices are up. There was some drought in Colombia or whatever. You accept that, you pay more, or you shift to another product, but you, you know, you, you're kind of used to that. So there are ways to handle that. Um, so you want to ask the question, what is management strategy? Is it related to turnover? Is it related to margin, net margin? What are they trying to do? Um, advertising tends to be a gross margin kind of thing. Try to get more customers in and you're spending some money to do that. Um, you know, so, all right. So we are at it, boy. We probably can't have the team competition on Tuesday. It may have to be Thursday. Um, so um, next Tuesday, I'm going to finish up Walmart on net margin and gross margin and do the profitability ratios. Have y'all had ROE decomposition? Does that sound familiar? All right. So we'll definitely do that a little differently than the accountants. All right. So this weekend, um, get asset turnover written. You can wait on margin. And then this might be, since we didn't get through margin, this might be a good weekend to set up a Zoom with me on your liquidity and solvency if you've got questions. Um, so feel free to email me and set up a time. If you if you and another student do the same company, you want to do a Zoom together, that's fine as well. Just let me know. 